Well, now the Bible is made up of the words of men and the Word of God. It has many human authors, one divine editor, and the one were not always aware of the other. In fact, I don't think any of the authors really realized they were writing the Bible or that the Holy Spirit would put together what they were writing with so many others. Most of them were responding to an immediate need. For example, Paul's little letter to the Philemon, that's a lovely little letter. It's all about a runaway slave who came all the way from Philippi to lose himself in the metropolis of Rome and found himself friends with Paul and came to know Jesus Christ as Saviour. And Paul now said, I'll have to send you back and I'll cover, you, cover it with a letter. I know your master, your Philemon, and he wrote that little letter, Dear Philemon, if, uh, if your slave has pinched any money from you, I'll repay it myself. But he said, you'll find him useful now. Now I wonder if you realize the significance of that because the slave's name was Onesimus, which means useful. And I think it was just a nickname given by the master, but he said, Paul writes, he may have been useless to you, but now you'll find him useful. It's a very human little letter, but it's a picture of salvation. Jesus came to make us useful to God again and send us back to our Lord and Master. It's a little picture of what salvation's all about, recycling people, making them useful again. <laughs> but you see, that's just a little human letter, a little human letter. And most of the books of the Bible were written for a very human reason but they were also edited for a divine reason and therefore we can study them at these two levels and I call them the historical and the existential level. The historical level, why was it written? What was the human reason behind it? The existential level, why is it in our Bible and why does God want us to know about this? And I'm going to approach Acts in those two ways. In this first talk we're going to look at Acts historically and then in the second talk we look at it existentially and ask why has the divine editor put it in the Bible for us? But let's ask first, why did the human author write it? What was the reason behind it? Now Luke is the only Gentile author in the entire Bible. There are 40 different writers in the Bible, 39 of them were Jewish, Hebrew thinkers. Luke of course got most of his material from Hebrews but he was a Gentile. And we need to know a little about him just to get the feel of this author. First of all, he was a doctor. That's rather important. It reveals God's sense of humour, actually. But here is this doctor. Now, medicine was fairly well advanced. You've all have heard of Hippocrates and the Hippocratic Oath. That's about 400 years before Christ. And medicine was highly developed. They had careful training. Mind you, their ideas are a bit weird. They believe that health is a matter of balancing the four bodily fluids, phlegm, blood, black bile and yellow bile. And if you got those four in balance, you were a healthy person. That's how they operated. But it did train medics to be observant, to be analytical, to be very, be very careful in their records and in their practice. And all this comes out in Luke's Gospel and his book of Acts, for he wrote these two volumes and he wrote them for the same reason, indeed for the same person, as we'll see in a moment. But you get this very careful observation, very careful records, very accurate records, more accurate than any other writer in the Bible perhaps. He's so careful to get things down as they really happened. The medical terms keep coming in, which uh, proves he was a doctor, and you get medical terms constantly. But the important thing is that God, with his sense of humour, used a doctor to describe the virgin birth to us. I think that's delightful. And to get all the details from Mary, you see Matthew gives us Joseph's angle on Jesus' birth and indeed Joseph's genealogy. It certainly wasn't Jesus' genealogy in Matthew, not physically, because if it had been, Jesus could never be king of the Jews because Jeconiah is in there and Jeconiah was cursed and told by God, no son of yours will ever be on the throne of David. But that was Jesus' legal genealogy in Matthew. In Luke we've got his physical genealogy through Mary. But Jesus was in fact the son of David legally through his dad and physically through his mum and he got it twice. So he was doubly eligible. But Luke, as a doctor, talked to Mary 
Uh, and so you get Mary's angle on the birth and the intimate details. You get details of Jesus' circumcision, things like the swaddling clothes. That's just diapers and nappies to you and me, but it's swaddling clothes. These little details are there. They're the kind of thing a doctor would be interested in. And also, God used this doctor to attest the healing miracles of Jesus and the early church. Isn't it interesting to get a doctor to do all that? Um, some doctors are pretty sceptical, even Christian doctors are sceptical about healing miracles, but God chose a doctor to record all these things. He was not one of the twelve, he'd never met Jesus personally, so he had to depend on eyewitnesses. But doctors are pretty good at finding things out and questioning people. Now the second thing is, he's a Gentile, a native of Antioch, which was the Paris of the ancient world, that's how it's described. It was right at the eastern end of the Mediterranean and well north of the Promised Land and was almost certainly the far country that the prodigal went to. That's where everybody went to spend their money and to have a gay time. And it was known as a pretty immoral town. And yet there was the first Gentile church, the first gathering of Christian believers that was entirely Gentile. So, of course, they couldn't be called Jews. What could they be called? And it was there that the nickname Christian was invented. But be it noted, the Christians didn't use that name of themselves, and I wish we could drop it. I believe it's a misleading term. I'd much rather say disciple or believer, which is the two things in the book of Acts they called themselves. But Luke records faithfully that they were first called Christians at Antioch, his hometown. And Luke's interest can be summed up by saying he was, he was interested in how this new religion began among the Jews but finished among the Gentiles. It is a unique thing for a religion to jump ethnic barriers like this. Most people were born into their national religion and stayed in it. But here's a religion that has jumped from one people to another and he's concerned about this. You could almost call the book of Acts a tale of two cities or how they brought the good news from Jerusalem to Rome. But it's from the Jewish capital to the Gentile capital. This was his interest, and he has faithfully recorded how that all happened. Now thirdly, he was a traveller, and a, a, a very experienced traveller. So he'd left his practice, and there are two points of interest in his travels. Number one, who he went with, and the answer is he travelled with Paul. And from time to time in the narrative of Acts, he changes to the first person plural, we, we set sail from. And he's just in his own way saying, uh, like that Welsh comedian, what's his name? I was there. Max Boyce, I was there. By the way, when these videos go out across the world, you can always say, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the proof on this camera over here. So he was there. He doesn't say specifically, Luke went. He says, we went. It's just his quiet way. Interesting that all the New Testament writers push attention away from themselves. If you want to know about Matthew, you have to read Mark. When Matthew revised Mark, he cut all the information about himself out. Isn't it interesting? Mark, we owe Mark to Peter, really, but we have all the bad things about Peter and Mark, but. Uh, doesn't draw attention to himself. Luke does the same thing. John did the same thing. He talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved. And all the authors of the New Testament turn attention to Jesus again and again, away from themselves. So does Luke. Doesn't draw attention to himself. We. But he travelled with Paul, and it's interesting that whenever Paul had to take a sea journey, Luke went with him. Now, I have a bit of a theory about that. <laughs> I don't know if it's right. But Paul had his physical problems and uh, Luke always travelled with him when he went by sea, not always by land, but every voyage, don't know if you ever noticed that, every voyage this <coughs> doctor went with Paul to see him through the voyage. And one of the descriptions of one voyage, the shipwreck, is one of the best bits of literature in the ancient world. It's the most <coughs> vivid description of that storm and the eventual uh, wreckage on the shores of Malta. So he travelled with Paul, especially on his voyages from Troas to Philippi, the voyage to Jerusalem, from Caesarea to Rome. The doctor went with him and I'm sure looked after his physical needs. But this meant 
that when Paul was under arrest, Luke was hanging about doing nothing. And it meant he was two years in Jerusalem and two years in Rome. And I believe it was during those two periods that he wrote first the Gospel and then Volume 2, the Book of Acts. Now that's my theory, but it fits. Because in Jerusalem he had two years when he could talk to Mary, to many others who were still around, who knew firsthand and could get all the information that he later got. But when he was in Rome, he could ask Paul frequently, now what did you do when I wasn't with you in uh, such and such a place? So I believe he wrote the two volumes during those two periods of two years. Whether I'm right or not doesn't really matter, except as we shall see in a moment. Well, secondly, where did he travel? Not just who did he travel with, but where? <coughs> And I've already said that he went on every voyage, but that he had these two periods in Jerusalem and Rome. Why would he use those two periods to write those two volumes? That's the question. Well, we'll answer it in a moment. Let's now look at the next thing we know about him. He was a writer and a very skillful writer. I've already told you that account of the shipwreck has been acclaimed as one of the masterpieces of literature from the ancient world. Whether it was in the Bible or not, it, it would still be a masterpiece and would be quoted as good literature. A man of no mean ability had a good vocabulary, excellent style, he can hold your interest, he keeps the pace up, it's pace that keeps people interested, keeping them moving keeping the plot going. And uh, one of you has already told me you found it much easier to read through Acts than through Matthew. Though Acts is longer, but it holds your interest, skillfully written, and it keeps you going all the way. He's a writer and a historian, and the key to being a good historian is to know what to leave out. And he's left out a whole lot. He knows what to select, he knows just what to include, what to say and what not to say accurate, factual, above all he's a man who does his research and a good writer will spend a lot of time on research before he puts pen to paper so he's got his facts at his fingertips and he knows what he's going to say. Finally, Luke is an evangelist. No question about it that his one desire was to get folks saved. Salvation is a key word in both volumes. Comes again and again salvation or save runs all the way through. I hope you underline Bibles, hope you wreck them. Mine's got to that awful position where I've got to buy a new one and I hate it. You know, it's like getting a new pair of slippers for Christmas and by Boxing Day you're back into the old ones. And you know, when you underline, underline things in colour. You know, don't be afraid of messing your Bible up, but colour the words that stand out. And in Luke and Acts, salvation and save keep coming out. He wants to get people saved. And he's got a particular interest as a Gentile in all flesh. In the Gospel of Luke, he quotes that um, prophecy of John the Baptist, and all flesh, well, Isaiah, but John the Baptist quotes it, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And you could say that's the theme of the Gospel of Luke, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And all flesh includes Samaritans, Gentiles, women, the poor. Luke in his Gospel really directs salvation at all these different groups of people. The theme of Acts is the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh, on Jews, Samaritans, and to the ends of the earth. So all flesh is his interest. Here is this Jewish religion which Luke sees is for everybody in the whole wide world. And so he sees Jesus in his Gospel as the Saviour of the world. But in the book of Acts we have a, a different emphasis. He's interested in the whole inhabited earth. But in Greek that phrase is one word, oikumene, from which we get the word ecumenical. But oikumene means the whole inhabited world, not the whole church, the whole world. And Luke is ecumenical. He wants to see salvation go to the whole world. But he knows he's not a preacher. He is a writer. And so his way of spreading the gospel is to write. Now what's your way? God has given you a way in which you can do it. I know some artists who do it purely by cartoons. That's their way of saying it. You might find that's your way. He's been sketching me while I've been <laughs> 
speaking, but uh, find a way to communicate, find your way. And Luke says, my way is writing. And that's what he did, as well as being a medic to the greatest missionary. What a ministry that was. You know, Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to a prophet, you get a prophet's reward. That's a lovely promise, isn't it? If you help a ministry along, you get the same reward as that ministry. So we can all do something and we can all get a big reward. But uh, Luke was the medical attendant for Paul, especially when he was overcome with seasickness. Now then, the reader. Let's come at it from another angle now. I've tried to talk about the writer, but now let's talk about the reader. And you notice I don't say readers. Luke wrote these two volumes for one man. Now that's incredible. His name is Theophilus, which means Mr. God Friendly. But we'll call him Theo for short. Now who was Theo? And why would this doctor write so much for one man? Mind you, of course, one soul is worth saving. It's worth every effort to win one person. But having said that, this is an awful lot of trouble. I think he'd spent a total of four years doing his research and writing these two volumes, all for one man. Well, it seems a little doubtful stewardship, to say the least, the time and energy involved. Who was this man? Now, there are two theories, and what I'm going to tell you now is speculation, but it fits. Sometimes we can take the evidence and deduce something from it. The first theory is that Theophilus is an imaginary figure. It's like we might say, I'm writing this book for the sincere inquirer, dear Mr. Sincere Inquirer. And that Theophilus is a made-up name, God-friendly, to mean somebody who's interested in the faith, who's wanting to find God, who's looking for God, well then here's an account of how you may through Jesus. Well, that's a nice theory. I don't think it fits all the facts. I believe Theophilus was an individual, that Mr. Godfriendly really did exist. And we've got to ask, why would Luke write two volumes for just one man? must be a very good reason. And this is where we move into theory and speculation, as I've admitted. But nevertheless, was he a publisher, for example? Because then uh, he would spread all this as quickly as possible. Or was he a teacher? So did Luke see him as a very good potential convert because he was a good communicator and could spread it? Well, possible. But there's one possibility that really does fit. He is obviously a man of some importance, some public office, because he gives him a title as well as a name. He says, most excellent, Mr. Godfriendly. And only a few people held that title in the ancient world. And the possibility is this, that he was a lawyer, even perhaps a judge, but certainly a lawyer, and that would earn that title. Now, why would Luke want to give a lawyer such a full account, first of Jesus and then of Paul? The answer is, he's the lawyer who's going to defend Paul at his trial in Rome. And the lawyer has said, now Paul, if I'm to defend you, I want a, a full brief. I want to know about this Jesus you say you follow and how this new religion started. I want you to tell me everything that will help me in presenting your case, and I want you to give me all you can about your own life and how you've got on with Roman authorities everywhere, what you've been charged with before, what your previous trials have been about. I want to know everything I can. And I think, dear Dr. Luke said, Paul, I'll write that down for you. Leave that to me. I'll do the research. When he was in Jerusalem, he researched the life and death of Jesus, and in Rome, did all the research and writing down of Paul. Now, if this is right, it would explain so much in both volumes. To put it very simply, it explains why in both volumes the Romans are entirely sympathetic to this new religion. You never get a Roman criticizing either Jesus or Paul. And in fact, at their two trials in Jerusalem, both in the trial of Jesus and in the trial of Paul, there are three statements that they are totally innocent. 
Pilate three times says this man is innocent. Three times Roman authorities say Paul is innocent. We could let him go free if he hadn't appealed to Rome. Do you follow this? So that in fact both volumes say the trouble that Christians have caused is not because of anything they do. It's because the Jews have always stirred it up, not the Romans. In Roman eyes, both Jesus and Paul were totally innocent. Now, can you see how the brief is building up? And it explains a whole lot more. For example, we call the Acts the Acts of the Apostles. It isn't at all. Two-thirds of it is about Paul. And as soon as Paul is converted, everybody else disappears from the scene, and the whole thing is about Paul. You see? Peter's only mentioned to lead up to Paul. Then as soon as Paul comes, Peter's forgotten. The whole thing is to defend Paul and say to the Roman authorities, there is nothing seditious or su subversive about this new religion. It is always sympathetic to the authorities. Paul is a Roman citizen. Jesus was innocent by Roman law. It was only because of Jewish pressure that Jesus was crucified, only because of Jewish pressure that Paul's ever got into trouble, as far as the Romans are concerned. Now, you see, the key is that in Rome, Paul was on trial in a place where the Jews could not twist the verdict. In Jerusalem they could, but Paul is now in Rome, and the Jews can't interfere with justice. Beginning to get the feel of something? So that if this is the briefing of Paul's lawyer to defend him, it all fits. And I'll tell you what really does fit, the fact that Acts finishes so abruptly. Have you ever noticed it, it seems to suddenly stop? No conclusion. It stops with Paul awaiting trial. Now it raises another interesting question. Was this brief successful? Did the lawyer get Paul off? And the answer is all the evidence points to the fact that he did and that Paul was released from that first trial. The letters he later wrote to Timothy and Titus contain details which do not fit into his life before that trial. They're, they clearly imply that he had later freedom and was later rearrested and then found guilty and beheaded. There is even a strong tradition that he reached Spain, which was his ambition. He wanted to reach Spain and plant churches there. Some of the ancient churches in Spain claimed that Paul was their founder. We can't say for certain, but the evidence of tradition points to the fact that Paul was released at his first trial, but then rearrested and later beheaded. So it looks as if Luke's work was not wasted. Having said all that, if Luke wrote it primarily to save Paul's life and save this great missionary, this apostle, for more ministry, then he succeeded. But having done that, aren't we grateful to God that Luke ever did the research and gave that brief? Because otherwise we would have no, no account of the early church. And it fills a vital gap between the Gospels and the letters and is indeed essential to understanding the whole New Testament. So there it is. I mean, the fact that Paul gives his testimony three times in the book of Acts. You must have noticed that. And yet none of the other apostles give their testimony. So why is Paul's testimony so wonderful or so important? Well, because it's Paul who's on trial. And it's vital that they hear what he said at every one of his previous trials, so that it all can be used in evidence for him and not against him. Well, I'll leave you with that uh, speculation, but it seems to me that it the two volumes answer perfectly the questions of a lawyer who said, who started this new religion? How did Paul come to be involved? And how have Roman authorities reacted to it elsewhere? And those are exactly the questions a lawyer would want to have answered in his brief. We've, my wife and I have seen people through court and I've sat in barristers' chambers and they're exactly the kind of questions they want to know. And we've got it here. Well, whether that's so or not, nevertheless, Luke must have had a wider audience in mind and I hope that what he'd researched would reach a wider audience, and indeed it has. Even the court hearing would be heard in public, so the public would hear all these facts. They'd be brought out in the court. But uh, there was, in those days, journalistic reporting of cases, 
so that again, I'm sure Dr. Luke hoped that the journalists would get some of this down and get it out and headlines would appear about this new religion. But above all, the trial was in the capital of the Gentile world. And what happened in Rome spread everywhere. So that this was a key trial. Christianity was on trial for the first time in Rome, not Paul, Christianity. So it's a vital case. And thank God for this doctor who said, I'll brief the lawyer. I'll tell him everything I can find out accurately. I'll get all my dates right. I'll get all my titles right. I'll get everything absolutely right. So he says, Theophilus, many have written about these things, but I wanted to get it accurately down. I wanted you to have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And here it is, O oh, Theophilus. Right, well, let's look at the thing from a historical point of view now. You could call his two volumes Christianity, the history of Christianity, parts one and two. And uh, that's how I'm going to treat them now. Superbly written history covering a period of 33 years from the beginning of Jesus' public ministry through to Paul's imprisonment or house arrest in Rome. It's full of facts, but it's also full of feelings. He's got a good bedside manner, this doctor, and there's a, a sensitivity to people. The way he talks, he's sensitive to people. I'm sure that's how he got the details out of Mary who was very discreet and kept all these things in her heart, but talking to a family doctor, she would pour them out and say, well, this is how it happened. Now, the structure of the book is an important clue to it. And uh, once we've decided why a book was written, the next question you usually ask is, what is the structure of the book, the skeleton, the framework? How does he build it up? Um, try and take the skin and flesh off the book. What, is the, what are the bones of it? And here we have three different theories, and you can take your pick. The simplest theory is that the structure of the book of Acts is that it's in two sections, and that Peter and Paul are the heroes, and that these are the two most important characters in the history of the early church. Peter, the apostle to the Jews, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And indeed, that is a, a good division. And there is a remarkable parallel between what Luke says about Peter and what Luke says about Paul. It's almost as if Luke says, I'm going to say exactly the same thing about both of them. Because the biggest danger in the early church was that there would be two denominations, a Jewish church and a Gentile church. And both Paul and Peter were concerned that that should never happen. And Luke seems to have shared this burden. And so he says, I'm not going to set Peter and Paul against each other because they are both exactly the same. Here are some of the similarities. They both did miracles. They both saw visions. They both suffered for their faith. They both made long speeches. They were both filled with the Spirit. They both preached with boldness. They both preached to Gentiles and Jews, though Peter primarily preached to Jews and Paul primarily to Gentiles. They were both imprisoned and miraculously set free. They both healed the sick. They both healed a congenital cripple. They both exorcised demons. They both had extraordinary means of healing, Peter's shadow and Paul's hankies. They both raised the dead. They both declared judgment on false teachers. They both refused worship. And so I could go on. When you put them side by side, you find that Luke puts exactly the same things against Peter's name and against Paul's name. It's as much as if he's saying there's nothing to choose between them. So don't follow one or the other. Don't set them over against each other. And of course, they both died in Rome. Peter and Paul, the two greatest figures in the early church. Acts of the Apostles, where are all the Apostles? There are only two of them. It's the Acts of the Apostles, Peter and Paul. And so that danger in the early church of two, two denominations, the book of Acts holds them together. It holds Peter and Paul together and says, nothing to choose between them. They both did exactly the same things for different people. Well, that's one way of approaching the book of Acts, to divide it into two sections. First 12 chapters, Peter. Second section, Paul. And you notice that Paul has the larger section. 
Now, that's one way. Another way is to divide it three ways, geographically. First way is to divide it two ways between two people. The second way is to divide it geographically between three areas. And right at the beginning of Acts, there is the statement, you shall be my witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, the ends of the earth. And it's almost as if Luke is following that order in the way he develops his theme. It's very beautifully put together. So it starts in Jerusalem, chapters 1 to 7, chapters 8 to 10, take it further into Judea and Samaria, and then it spreads from there to Europe and the ends of the earth. So that's a possible structure. But I want to take it in a little more detailed way. I've put some verse references here. And if I read you those, you would, I think, begin to understand something. Let me just try and go through them quite quickly. Acts 6, 7 says this, So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Chapter 9, verse 31 says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Turn to 12, 24, and I read this. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. 16, verse 5, reads like this. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. And verse 20 of chapter 19 reads, In this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now did you notice the similarity between those? Everyone states, and the church grew, and the church grew, and the church grew, and they're all together five of those statements through Acts. It's as if that marks the end of a section. Do you follow me? He tells us a lot of things that happened, and then he summarizes, so the church grew and spread. More information, and the church grew and spread. More information, the church grew and spread. That's his real theme, the growth and spread of this new religion around the Roman Empire. And when you look at what is said before each of these summaries, you find a very clear spreading ripple. And each section is a wider ripple and belongs to that wider ripple. And I think that's his basic structure. That's how he's thinking. It's as if a stone has been thrown in the pond, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus, and now the ripples. And at the end of each ripple, he just summarizes it, so the church grew and spread. Then he tells us of another ripple out, the church grew and spread. It's a very clear historical approach, and I think it opens up the book of Acts very well. And this explains the selection of events. It's obvious that he hasn't told us everything. You couldn't. The world would not contain the books if everything the early church had done and said was written. So why is he selecting what he does? He selects the key events which produce the next ripple. And every time he highlights something that suddenly spread the gospel further. Do you understand? Now, what was the first great event to spread the gospel? Day of Pentecost, with all the nationalities gathered for the feast, and the stone is thrown in, the Holy Spirit comes on 120 people. In the temple, by the way, not the upper room, because they never moved. They didn't rush out preaching, they just stayed where they were, seated. Eleven of them stood up with Peter, and that's all. They didn't move. It was in the temple, the house of God, and they were there for the morning prayers at nine o'clock. They were in Solomon's porch. If you want to see the exact spot, it's where the Mosque al aqsa is today, on the south end of the temple area. And the Mosque al aqsa marks Solomon's porch where the Christians met for the prayers. Nine o'clock in the morning, in the house of God, the wind blew. And that was the stone in the pond. 
It's going to reach the ends. There were people from Rome and Cyrene and Libya and all over the world there. And they heard it. They said they're drunk. And Peter showed a masterly um, preacher's touch by getting up and saying, we're not drunk. The pubs aren't open yet. <laughs> it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Don't get drunk at this hour. But you see, the very sign of all the different languages was the reversal of the Tower of Babel. God gave all those languages at Babel to confuse mankind. Now he's giving all the languages to draw them together and reverse Babel. Uh, somebody once told me there's no mention of tongues in the Old Testament. Of course there is. Babel was the first time that God gave different languages, but for a very different purpose. It was judgment then, now it's mercy. But that was the first stone in the pond, the first event which caused the ripples. Then, of course, uh, the widow's complaints about not getting a fair share of the food was a key event for spreading the church. Interestingly enough, what the church today would do, they'd appoint a committee of women for the catering, but the church early days was much more sensible. They appointed seven men <laughs> to serve tables. And you know why they did? Because these were widows without a man, and they needed men to look after them. So they appointed seven men, but out of those seven men came Stephen. And most great Christian ministers begin as Christian servants. Paul began as a deacon looking after the funds with Barnabas. We need to remember this, that those first seven men chosen to serve tables, it seemed an insignificant event, but for Luke, he could see that that was absolutely significant and it led to Stephen's martyrdom, which scattered the Christians, which seemed a disaster, but actually was just spreading the ripple. It all began with appointing a man to look after tables. See, he's only choosing those things that led to these bigger ripples. And, uh, well, I'm getting excited about it. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> the Samaritan conversion, that was crucial when Philip, one of those seven deacons, went to Samaria. A revival broke out. Crucial event. Now the gospel was touching the Samaritans. And, you know, Peter and John came down to pray that the Samaritans would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think that's incredible. The last time Peter and John were there, they prayed that God would send fire from heaven to burn them all up. Now they're asking for fire from heaven for a different reason. It shows what a change has taken place in their hearts. But it was crucial. And that Ethiopian eunuch, what's so important about him? He was going to take the gospel to Africa, the first African. See? These are not just haphazard conversion stories. These are vital events which at the time seemed small, but looking back caused another ripple to spread out. See? So Luke is very careful. He doesn't tell us every conversion in the early church. There were hundreds, thousands, but he picks out those that in the light of their effect were so extraordinary. And then there was the factor of uh, the fact of Peter and Cornelius' house, Peter having to eat non-kosher food. Didn't like that one bit, yet how significant that was. And the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15 met to decide whether Gentiles had to become Jews before they could follow Jesus. And the council said no, which is why you didn't have to become a Jew to follow Jesus. The big issue now is the opposite. Do Jews have to become Gentiles to follow Jesus? The answer is also no. Let Jews remain Jews and follow Jesus. Let Gentiles be Gentiles and follow Jesus. Well, the book of Acts finishes with Paul saying, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles. If the Jews won't have it, he always went to the Jews first. But if they wouldn't have it, he said, All right, the Gentiles will. That's how the good news came to us, because we're the Gentiles who believe. We'll finish the talk there.